Well, um, I think we'll, we'll start right on. If we can have the, the lights off, then I'll start uh, clicking ahead. For most folks, when you hear about the topic of climate change, I'm sure you know it's controversial and you're probably expecting maybe I'll either be taking this stand or this stand here. Um, uh, what I'd like to reassure you is that in the scientific community, it's basically a settled question and we've been moving on and kind of uh, exploring other aspects of this and there's a lot of really interesting things coming out of the scientific community, including putting our position now, including, now, including not just climate change, but our effects on species and pollution into the context of Earth history. And in the past, we've divided up geologic time with the age of dinosaurs and the Pleistocene epoch and the Eocene epoch when different things happened with other life forms. Now it's taken uh, basically as a technical geologic phase of Earth history. It's the age of humans. It's being called the Anthropocene epoch which we are in now, where we have become a geological force of nature. And what I'd like to do tonight is take this geological perspective of where we are now and where we've come so far and push it far farther into the future, which is basically the cutting edge of climate change research. Keeping in mind that, of course, it's difficult to predict the weather from day to day. We're not talking about weather. Weather is kind of like bumps in the road on an uphill trip where you're driving all day. Uh, what I'll be talking about is long-term trends of climate, which is where you take the average direction you're going in. In this case, it'd be the upward journey, and clearly we're on an upward trend. Um, but what we tend to do is live in our short-term lifestyles where we think, you know, um, to the end of the work day is a long time is forever or something. And uh, the, the most computer models are only looking ahead to the end of this century of how warm will it get. But uh, for somebody with a geoscience background or thinking about Anthropocene epochs and things like that, a natural question is, what comes after 2100 AD? Is the world going to come to an end? How warm can it get? Well, what I'd like to do is take you over that ridge and uh, look into the long-term effects of the things we're setting in motion now, which we can actually do pretty accurately. And it basically boils down to asking, where does all the carbon dioxide go that we're releasing from our tailpipes and smokestacks? Um, it basically stays around the planet. Um, geoscientists are looking at the geochemistry and physics of where this stuff goes and how long it takes. And what it basically reveals, which I'll show you tonight, is that the, the cleanup from our carbon dioxide releases is going to take not just a, a few decades or centuries, but thousands of years. And if we continue without cutting back uh, as quickly as we can, it could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years to recover from this. Well, most of it's going to go into the oceans. It uh, dissolves naturally in seawater, which is a problem in itself. It makes acids when it does that. But it'll take several thousand years for the oceans to absorb what we've released already. But that will, that, that's still going to leave between a fifth and a quarter of our emissions still stranded on the air with nowhere to go keeping the temperatures warmer than it would all, all otherwise have been until slow geological processes reacting with limestone and granite eventually dissolve the stuff, take it out of the air, drop it into rivers leading into the ocean where the ocean can then sort of finish the job and precipitate the stuff out as muds and shells and coral reefs. When you add up how long that takes, we have set in motion events that are going to last for tens of thousands of years, maybe hundreds gigantic thing. We've become a force of nature. And what we now face today is a basically a simple choice. We all know, well, if we've got this global warming, we can head it off by switching to non-carbon fuels as quickly as possible, which we have a lot of good reason to do in addition to the climate. Uh, or we can go ahead and burn all the stuff and then be forced to switch later on when we run out of the coal, oil, and gas. So uh, what I've got here is a, a graph that's uh, from some of the research that got me interested in this topic. It's looking into the future, starting now, 10, 20, 30, 40, 100,000 years into the future. And it's basically measuring how much carbon dioxide is in the air, depending on what decisions we make in the next few decades. So uh, right now, we have about 400 parts per million in carbon dioxide in the air. The number doesn't matter too much. If we cut back quickly, as fast as we can, and switch to non-carbon fuels, we'll probably go up to 550 or 600. And then here's the ocean soaking that stuff up, and then the rocks slowly taking the rest of the way till about 100,000 years from now. So that's shocking to think of what we've already done. 
But uh, that's no reason to give up and say, well, the damage is done. No, because if we don't, if we burn all the coal that we can get, get our hands on and then run out in 100 or 200 years, it's going to go up to that, 2,000 parts per million probably, then be soaked up here and then take maybe half a million years to recover. Now, there's some other things to look at, at this, besides just the mind-boggling time scales on here of what we're doing now in our lifetime. But um, another thing is I noticed that, look at that spike there. This is the global warming that we're thinking about now, 2180, maybe the next couple hundred years. And then look at that when it finally peaks out and starts to recover, it's like a pinpoint, like a whiplash effect where you were warming, warming, and then suddenly you get into this rapid cooling recovery. And if you think about that, uh, cooling can be stressful too. And maybe even that turnaround time and that sharp point could be pretty disruptive as well, where you're used to the warming and now you flip into cooling mode. So you'll have the warming that we're thinking about now for the next couple, few centuries, then a whiplash effect, which will be a, a stress in itself, and then a rapid global cooling that we have to deal with, and then this long, long, long recovery. So um, pretty amazing to be living in a time of Earth history in the Anthropocene epoch this century when that choice is going to be made by us, basically. So what will that be like? How do we decide if we want to go ahead or not and burn all that coal? Um, basically, we look to the past. Some of these things have happened before naturally. If we cut back as quickly as we can and do the moderate scenario, we'll probably end up by 2280 with something like a natural warm period before the last ice age. We got a couple of degrees warmer. Sea level came up several meters. Nothing that things couldn't really deal with. Um, so this has happened before. If we switch to alternatives, we'll probably end up doing that. Um, but if we go ahead and burn all the stuff, um, the changes will be off scale of anything that has happened for the last 55 million years on the Earth. And we did have a warming like that back then. Um, basically, all the ice in the world melted. Sea level was up uh, about 70 meters higher than it is now. Um, and you had forests at the poles. You had animals and plants running around and scampering through the forest from pole to pole, but there were no polar bears back then, for sure, or anything that liked ice. Um, so it was a mixed bag. But the, the main point here is that there's more to the story than just the warming. The first phase of what we're setting in motion is actually relatively short term, this global warming where the ice sheets are retreating. Then it's going to cool off. And in the far future, the climate crisis is going to be the whiplash, and then global cooling, where ice sheets are advancing. These are all stressful changes, all of which we're setting in motion now. Um, so things are going to have to adapt to rising sea levels and then to falling sea levels as well. And you can sort of predict a lot of these things, but um, although you can say this has happened in some form in the geologic past before, you know, why should we worry? Well, the difference is this is a different geologic epoch. It's the age of humans. We are in the way. So even in that extreme case where animals, let's say, could move from pole to pole with no problem to find the temperatures they preferred, we are now in the way. And it makes those migrations difficult. So uh, I suspect people will somehow manage to adapt to most of this. It's the other species that are in big trouble because we are in the picture now, which we weren't before. So you can see these things happening now. It's important to remember that it's, uh, it's not all negative. It's not all positive. It's a mixed, very complicated thing. The ethics come in when it's us making the change happen, not just some natural geological process. So what right do we have to favor one or the other? But it's interesting to see. Like we hear about the loss of the polar bears and the ring seals as the ice is retreating now. Um, but the other things are benefiting as the ice disappears. Other species are moving up from the North Atlantic and Pacific. Harbor seals are moving in, replacing the ring seals. Grizzly bears and brown bears are moving north into polar bear territory, hybridizing with the polar bears. So while some things are losing out, others are moving in. So how do you judge the ethics of this? There's a huge land grab going up there. If, if you're skeptical of climate change, um, talk to the people that are about to go to war over little pieces of rock in the Arctic Ocean that um, will give them claim to the Northwest Passage over the pole and the Russian Passage over the pole and coal, oil, and gas. That's a, 
Denmark and Canada almost uh, came to blows. The Danes claimed this island, put a flag on it with a bottle of snop saying, welcome to the Danish island. The Canadians said, nope, it's ours. They knocked it down, put up the Canadian flag. I don't know if they put a bottle of Molson's on there or not. Uh, you may or may not know the Russians have claimed the North Pole by sending a submersible down under the ice in the deep sea, planting a titanium flag on the North Pole. This is a real thing. Um, when people are putting the money there, you know it's not controversial. Um, if you think of what Greenland might be like without the ice on it, we know you can do radar through the ice. Uh, it turns out without the ice on there, you have a fjord in the middle, a protected harbor. There are all kinds of minerals and gems there. There'll be a new fisheries up there too, and the trade routes. So you can see the effects of the changes are gonna be massive. Some will benefit. Some will lose. It's a very complicated thing. And of course, the ethics come in because we are causing these to happen. Uh, the one pretty much universal negative, however, in addition to the climate, which would eventually reverse and benefit some people, the, the universal negative is that when the CO2 goes into the ocean, it acidifies the ocean as well. And it's disruptive to anything with a shell that can dissolve, any of the shellfish, crabs, and prawns, and of course, the coral reefs are uh, being threatened by this, and the more carbon dioxide release now, the more acidic the oceans will become, the more species are at risk from that. We don't hear so much about this aspect of our carbon dioxide emissions. It's more than just global warming. So there's some facts here and there's some speculations. Fact number one, we will quit fossil fuels sooner or later, either on purpose or by running out. So that's not the question. It has to be done. Might as well do it on purpose. Um, how we do it then is going to influence the world for thousands of years. It's, we are incredibly important in the sweep of human history and Earth history right now. The people alive in the room and in, alive in the next several decades are going to make this decision. It's going to last as long. Some will gain, some will lose, then the trends will reverse. So just as in terms of ideas, um, just consider this. Um, not only are there going to be winners and losers in space, but also in time. So here's the Arctic now. Uh, in summer, it's frozen over. By 2180, almost certainly there won't be any sea ice in the summer. Well, that's going to last for thousands of years, long enough for new open water ecosystems and cultures to develop up there. And they'll be there for thousands of years until it starts to freeze again. And then imagine that, what stress they're going to have to go through when they wake up in the morning and there's a little bit of ice along the shore of the Arctic Ocean in the morning and the elders are down there, oh my gosh, what's this? I never saw that before. Just imagine if this continues, the whole ocean up there could freeze over and then we'll lose all the fisheries and how are we gonna make a living? It's just the scale of the changes we're setting in motion is stunning. We're gonna create ecosystems that are then gonna be destroyed by the recovery. It's an amazing idea. Also, just things, uh, because of the time scales involved we have, we're going to interfere with ice ages, which you could argue are also a, a major environmental problem when you bulldoze all of Canada and things like that. Um, the natural cycles would normally have made the next ice age happen in about 50,000 years. Our carbon dioxide is going to be around long enough to stop that next ice age. It's amazing. There will be just enough left floating in the air to warm the temperature enough to prevent that. So you could say as a cynic, well, maybe you that's a good side of something we've done. Unfortunately, the front end of that story is where the major crises are going to be. So how do we find a win-win situation for this to save the world, save the whales? Well, we should switch away as quickly as we can to alternative energy sources for many good reasons, even besides climate change. Um, if you don't know about thorium power or green nukes, uh, there's a lot of potential there. If it's as good as it's supposed to be, they can't melt down. You can't use them for weapons. The waste is relatively benign, and it can burn up nuclear waste left over from nuke programs, from weapons programs. There may be hope in things like that or other alternative sources. But kind of tongue in cheek in the big picture then, one more good reason to switch is if we do switch away from fossil fuels, we'll leave them in the ground and we'll save the carbon in the ground, sequestered naturally without having to pay for it. And it's there in the far future when the ice ages finally do come around again after the one we have stopped and other ones do in 130,000 years. Maybe the people then would not like to be bulldozed by an ice sheet and will have left the carbon in the ground. They can set fire to it if they decide they want to not have an ice age. 
you in Australia here, New South Wales, you've got a mountain that's been burning for 6,000 years in a coal seam. Well, you got this is a coal fire in China. Just uh, even if you're low tech in 100,000 years ago, and light a little fire, burn a few coal seams, and you stopped an ice age. <laughs> so the good news is humankind will survive, at least as a species. Bad news is many other species may not because of these changes we're in the way. The reality is we are going to decide that future by acting or by not acting. So you are incredibly important. You are a force of nature. What's in your mind will matter and will echo on down through the ages. The better informed you can be, the better the questions you can ask, and the better responses and choices of good ideas and solutions you can make. So welcome to your deep future. Thank you.